the gentlemen on the panel have quite a bit of very relevant experience for you, so I, I think you're going to enjoy the discussion. As a way of background, I graduated from the Stanford Business School in 1997. I have uh, been a founder of four different entities, uh, a company called Optical Engineering, making industrial CO2 lasers, drugstore.com, Good Technology, uh, New Schools Venture Fund, and also Tugboat Ventures, my most recent uh, company. I've been doing uh, Tugboat for the last four years. We're an early stage venture capital firm. Uh, moving uh, to the topic at hand, this panel is about idea evaluation. However, uh, in conversations with quite a few of the students over the years, what I hear most often is, is uh, the evaluation side is a bit easier. The idea generation side is, frankly, the harder part. And I often find people saying, where do great ideas come from? How do you know you've got a great idea? So the first piece is coming up with a great idea. The second piece, trying to determine the quality of that idea. So to kick off, I'd like to have each of the panelists introduce themselves. Uh, please take a minute or so. And then if you could give us your favorite quote, that would be helpful. <laughs> well, I'm Bob Fell, and I'm, uh, I've done a number of startups, and uh, we'll talk about some of them today, I imagine. Uh, and my favorite quote, actually, uh, came from Robert Kennedy. And it was, some people ask why. I choose to ask why not. Uh, my name is Brad Wiskirchen. I'm the CEO of Kinetics. Uh, we're headquartered in Boise, Idaho. Uh, my favorite quote is by Julius Caesar. It's uh, Vini Vidi Vici came, saw, conquered. His uh, report home after defeating, uh, after being victorious in a battle in uh, Asia Minor after four hours. And I like it because it's tough and be it's pithy. I, I aspire to be as pithy as that. So. Hi, my name is Justin Fisher Wolfson. I graduated from Stanford with a master's in computer science. Um, I'm at a venture firm called Founders Fund, which is well known for investments in Facebook, SpaceX, things like that. Worked at a variety of startups in the Valley, and I don't know, my favorite quote, which I'm coming up with off, offhand now, was, reality is governed by perception, but not changed by it. And it reminds me of, when I'm talking to other people, what, what to look, through, look at things through their eyes. I'm Kevin Reith, uh, co-founder and CEO of Outright.com, uh, kind of a late bloomer. This is my first kind of venture startup, uh, run product management in a lot of big Valley companies over the years. My favorite quote, and I'll probably not get it perfect, but uh, it's Thomas Edison when he talks about uh, some of the biggest failures in life are people who didn't realize how close they were to success before they gave up, because I think perseverance is pretty critical to be a successful entrepreneur. That's great. Thank you. So diving in, I, uh, my belief is you have to have a little context around the importance of an idea before we dive into the details of how you generate these ideas and how you evaluate these ideas. So could each of you take just a moment and give us a sense for how important do you think the idea is versus other elements of a successful business? I think we can stop with, start with Bob. I'm going to be first each time today, I guess. Um, okay. Um, I, I'll mention another quote. Edison's quote of it's 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. I, I think the idea is important, but I think it's not the most important thing. I mean, I think that there are a lot of good ideas, but it, it comes down to the implementation of the idea, the management team, the passion of the entrepreneur. I mean, if you were to ask me what's most important, does the idea stick with you? I mean, two days, five days, three weeks afterwards, are you passionate about it? And I think it's the passion of the idea and then the research to really see is there a market there. But I, I, I think idea generation is good. It, if you read the newspaper and if you speak to people and if you have a coterie of friends that are relatively well informed and if you have an international flair, you're going to see a lot of ideas. But it's those that stick with you that you can become passionate about that you've done the basic research on that really matter, in my mind. I would actually agree with Bob. Um, I don't think that the idea itself is the primary driver of success. A, co a cohesive team with the ability to execute, I think, is more important. Uh, and I agree that the passion is very important. Uh, someone said it's easier to breathe life, life into a corpse than it is to tame a fanatic, and I think that's true. I think if you've got a passionate team, they're going to work very hard. Um, and it's, uh, it, 
it's easy to recruit if you have a passionate team because everybody wants to be part of a passionate team. Everybody wants to rally around a morally compelling <coughs> initiative. And so uh, the idea in and of itself is great, um, but not the most important thing. And uh, that being said, I, this is coming from a guy who has a great research team who comes up with fantastic ideas all the time, and that's a pretty big luxury. So, cool. yeah. <laughs> so honestly, I, I think ideas are dangerous. What happens is... You know, people can get wedded to them, you can go down a path, and ultimately this, the big success or failure of the business will be determined whether or not you're chasing the right thing. So when you have a small group of people, it's an early stage company, you just want to figure something out, does the idea matter? Probably not. The people are way more important because the number of teams I've seen that have started in one path and gone a completely different way six months later, 12 months later, and built something very successful, I mean, there's a huge number of those people. But ultimately, if you go out and you chase an idea for a long period of time with a great group of people that's not very good, it's, there's a limit to how successful you can be. And I think there's a, you know, it's a question of where you are in the process that determines how important, important the idea is. Yeah, so I agree with all these comments. Um, I don't think a great idea is necessarily going to you know, give you success. There are so many other factors. The one caveat is uh, a bad idea is crippling, and especially an idea that's not based on a real need. Um, so there are so many failures out there where people, you know, people by nature, we tend to think in terms of solutions. We want to jump to the right answer. We want to get to that shortcut. Uh, and so we get wedded to an idea, and we get really excited about it. And if it's not grounded in a real need that a lot of people have and a lot of people that you can reach from a marketing perspective and get to, uh, it's going to be challenging. So there is something in kind of the early vetting. You, you need to be honest with yourself about the idea. If you don't get the, the feedback, you need to move on and iterate and change and adapt. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. So one of the things I want to also share as far as context, I talked to the panel members before this. This is not a, a discussion about ideas for companies which you might sell in a year. This is not about coming up with a quick momentum, something that's kind of in the zeitgeist of today that might be something that you could put a little money in, a little bit of time, and turn around and sell. This is really about how do you build a company that could be a lasting business, one that, you know, frankly, would be viewed as a remarkable company. So it's within that context that we're talking about idea generation, idea evaluation. So if your objective is not that, you know, discount some of this advice. Because, for example, building a great team if you're going to sell the company in 12 months is really not that important. You might need a great team of engineers, for example, as a technology company. But, again, context, I think, is important to understand this. So uh, for the gentleman that started companies, where did your idea come from? And why don't we start with Kevin? Sure. So uh, ours started, like many, with personal pain. So uh, my co-founder and I were running a web development company. We had left kind of big corporate America. And uh, our company, Outright.com, is uh, free online bookkeeping, very basic. Uh, and when running our company, even though we had worked it into it for years, trying to do the finances on QuickBooks, when we were both working at home and needed access to it, it was just painful. And we thought, there's got to be a better way. And as we went around and talked to a lot of our clients and vendors and other folks, uh, we found that there were a lot of people saying, there has to be a better way. Um, and so it started with, with kind of that, that personal pain. But what was interesting is our original concept that we put out there, and we actually threw up mock-ups on the web and asked people to check it out, uh, we didn't get the reception that we thought. Uh, it turns out that what people needed, the bigger opportunity in the market was something much simpler. And so being able to listen to the feedback and kind of change direction and recognizing that our first premise uh, didn't resonate in the market was pretty important. So I haven't founded a company, but I've been involved with a bunch of earlier stage startups, both on the operation side and on the investment side. And honestly, a lot of it comes down to finding a pain point. I think the one caution is that people often find things that are problems for themselves and not necessarily big problems. So that's, that's one thing to consider. A lot of us are consumers. We understand the consumer needs, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're solving a big problem. And some of the more interesting companies I've seen, you know, one of the, you know, when, when I was working in mobile, it was really around, you know, what are some of the big problems that you can solve for, you know, some enterprise players that, you know, people have built relationships with over time, and you can leverage those relationships to find out what the problems are. You know, you look at retailing, people have to hit their numbers every month, right? You know, on, on certain products, there's huge rebates. You, know, you don't necessarily know those things unless you've been in the industry. So leveraging, you know, industry knowledge in places that you've worked or things like that can add a lot of value. Uh, I guess... I'd be surprised if anybody in that room has ever heard of Kinetics. Uh, 
so I'll give a little background first. Kinetics is an internal incubator. Uh, we were founded in 98. Um, by internal incubator, what I mean is we have a research team that comes up with our own ideas, and those are the only ideas that we incubate. And we only incubate those ideas using our own money. We don't have any third party or institutional backers. Uh, we were founded in 98. We have no debt. We have 100 total employees. Um, uh, with uh, well in excess of $300 million in revenues this year and very, very highly profitable. So we've got a lot of money to do what we need to do in order to incubate companies and grow them. So we have, currently have two operating subs. The life cycle of a company in our, uh, of a, a subsidiary with our company is we have a research phase where we have a research team that evaluates, that takes any ideas that, are, that our members of our company come up with. They, have, they vet them for technological or business viability. Then we pass them on to our early stage investment phase where we incorporate, we do all the things we need to do in order to make the company viable. We have, a, we have a growth acceleration phase where we hire a standalone management team to take it to the next level with an eye to our liquidity event. We had our first liquidity event in, in 2000. Um, so we currently have two operating subs. The first is ClickBank, which is a very large online retailer of digital goods. We sell 35,000 titles produced by 12,000 <coughs> vendors. We have 2.8 million total affiliates in our affiliate network we, and over 110,000 of those facilitate a transaction in any given month. We do, um, it's, uh, it, we do 26,000 transactions a day, um, so it's a pretty sizable company. Uh, and then our second operating sub is uh, an early stage company. It's in our growth stage. It, it's in our early stage investment um, phase right now. It's a company called Count, spelled K-O-U-N-T. Uh, Count is an online risk control solution. Uh, not just online, it's basically card not present risk control solution. Uh, the way it came up was with ClickBank being a retailer of digital goods, there was a lot of, we saw a disproportionately large amount of uh, what, are, what are called tests on the internet where people with stolen credit cards or compromised cards would try to use, uh, would try to hit ClickBank in order to see if the cards were good. In the, in the brick and mortar world, it's like someone gets your credit card at a restaurant, they take it to a gas station immediately, plug it in the gas pump because nobody's going to cuff them and uh, they make sure the card's still good, then they go to Staples or somewhere, buy a, buy a laptop and fence it. Uh, they do that in the online world on digital goods because they don't have to put in a bunch of cardholder-specific data. There's no shipping address, et cetera. So we saw a lot of the bad guys. We were a test site just like any digital goods retailer was. Fortunately, our founder um, has a PhD in mathematics from Princeton, and, is, uh, and uh, this was his sweet spot, his online risk. He actually invented and patented device fingerprinting, which is kind of the risk control standard in the world right now. Um, and so he came up with solutions. We realized, hey, we've got this fantastic solutions that, solution that is highly effective for our, for our companies. Let's, uh, other, other online retailers may have the same, be suffering from the same problems. Uh, we sent some folks out to do some uh, analytics and determined it was the same. So as a result of our pain, the pain that we felt at ClickBank, we decided we could come up with a solution that worked for the rest of the world, and it's been remarkably successful. So um, we're very fortunate. Um, idea. Evaluation idea genesis. I'll I'll just go through three companies in which I have been involved. The, the most recent uh, is Price Lock, um, and how it came about is very simple. Uh, I had read about uh, Southwest Airlines having two billion of its earnings just by hedging its fuel costs, and I um, I'm involved in a uh, a a company for the benefit of inner school children, a, a food company, and I was across the street from a commissary filling up at the gas station, and two guys in a Dodge pickup were arguing over the price of gas. I think this was in uh, 2006. And uh, one guy said, it's going to go up 30 percent, 40 percent. And I, I just, I don't normally walk over to people in a gas station, but I walked over to these two guys, and I said, let me ask you something. Price is $1.67 on on uh, for gas. If you could get 1,000, 2,000 gallons, your full gallonage that you needed for the next few years and pay, and I added a quarter to the price, would you do it? And both those guys said, absolutely. We do it in a second. I said, how would you pay for it? They said, we use our credit card. I said, that's 18% money. We don't care. The price of gas is going up that much. And so it the idea started to gnaw at me, and much to the chagrin of my wife, every time I'd pull into a gas station, I'd go over and speak to people. <laughs> and and uh, ultimately, Price Lock was born to extend. You know, I, I, went, I had relationships at Goldman Sachs, and I did go see them and ask them. I learned a lot about hedging, and it was not just from 
you know, that occasion became a business, but we did our work and we put together the funding. I put my own money up in the beginning. But basically, it was as simple as how do you extend what Southwest Airlines had done to, to, the, to a whole new class of customers? And that's how PriceLock was born. Uh, the second company I'll talk to you about, uh, how the idea was generated, was really Premier Radio. Um, it, if you recall, and maybe some of you won't recall, in 1994, uh, everyone was buying radio stations. And I was at a conference much like this, the Milken Conference in L.A., and Sam Zell spoke. And he made this one comment, the world is buying radio stations. And an idea went off in my head. I said, you know, it's interesting. Everyone's buying radio stations. Why don't I try and get a radio programmer and build a radio programmer? Because it's axiomatic. When Rupert Murdoch bought the Metro Media stations, he wanted to form the Fox Network. If you own a distribution, you want to have the programming that goes with it. So I tried. I couldn't buy ABC or CBS. I couldn't afford it. But there was a small company called Premier Radio, which uh, I bought with a couple of people for $33 million. And then we just did a roll-up. We bought Jim Rome Sports and uh, Bob Costas in Sports and uh, talk shows. The last thing we bought, God forgive me, was Rush Limbaugh. But in any event, we did do that, and we became the largest radio programming company in the world, and we sold it, it's owned by Clear Channel now, for $498 million, so it was not a bad deal. The last idea that I want to talk about was an idea that, in my mind, we did too quickly, and we did it with your friends at Klein of Perkins, but you probably know it's Silicon Gaming. Um, the, I had been involved in electronic arts with Brooke Byers and the startup, and I said, and I was standing in Las Vegas with Steve Wynn, and he said, you know, it's not gonna always be the blue-haired ladies that play these machines, and all of a sudden I said, Jesus, you know, you have this touch technology, you have so much we've learned from the game business, why don't we put a group together and why don't we create a company? And we did create Silicon Gaming with the whole idea that Silicon Gaming would have the new type slot machine, that it would not be just this static, you know, press the button and watch your money. What We built the company. We put a lot of money into it. We had, uh, but we had a heck of a product. But what I didn't really do, and this is, goes to the, you know, a, an idea is only as good as its implementation. What I didn't really learn, and I did hire Andy Pascal, Steve Wynn's nephew, who ran the slot machine business for, at that time, MGM Mirage. But I didn't realize that it doesn't matter how good or bad the machine is. It just matters, can you get it in the location? People go there, and they play the machine, and it doesn't matter. You know, you can have beautiful graphics. You'll just spend a lot of money. It's get me something that works quickly, because the odds are all the same anyhow. So we sold it. We built the company. We got our money out with maybe a little bit of profit, not, not if you've count time, and we sold the company uh, to IGT, which is the largest in the slot machine business. So I, I come back to our original point. Ideas are only as good as their implementation, and the work you do to make sure that the market is big enough and that you can build a profitable business therefrom. Thank you. So uh, <clears throat> going from specific, I'd like to ask you now about, and, and, and Bob, I think you gave a few, and, uh, and Justin, you gave a few also, but any other thoughts on strategies for coming up with ideas? How do you go out in the world tomorrow? Let's say the four of you are starting fresh tomorrow, and you're like, I'm going to go build a big company. I want it to be a meaningful, remarkable company. I want it to matter. What would you do tomorrow to start looking for ideas? Anybody can take that one. We don't have to go in order. <laughs> four sons. The, you know, uh, two marriages going from, uh, you know, 29 down to, to uh, seven years old. And, I, you know, I, I look at the world of education and I see, you know, just generally uh, China going to school 30 percent more, Korea going to school 30 percent more. And if I were to start a company tomorrow, the general area of education would have huge appeal to me. I, I, I don't know what it would be, but. Oh, I mean, I think there's a lot of interesting opportunities in the education space. I also think there are opportunities in quantified health. I mean, there's a bunch of, there are a bunch of interesting th changes that are happening with sensors today. But I mean, maybe the broader question is, you know, how would you go about starting a company? Because 
I think first off, it's a question of what you're passionate about. So maybe you're passionate about healthcare, maybe you're passionate about education. You know, if you're not, don't worry about it, right? There's there's the general sense of if you want to build big businesses, if you want to build lasting businesses, something that will be a great enterprise, you're looking for the subset of opportunities that can be billion dollar companies. And that's not all companies, right? There, there are lots of very successful small businesses that drive most of the employment, as I've heard on the radio consistently in America. So, I mean, there are lots of great businesses that you can do, but if you want to build a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar company that has a real impact on a lot of people, that's a small subset of businesses. And so you have to think big and you have to understand where there's a big problem in a big market. And I think there's within that a subset of businesses that are easy, right? So going back to your point about, you know, distribution, right? You know, you're trying to get slot machines on the floor. Distribution in almost all businesses is a pretty big challenge. So the question is, you know, some, some ways are easier than others and some might be specific to your background and your relationships. So that's, that's kind of what I would start by thinking about it's like how do, what's a billion dollar business and then what's an easy billion dollar business and one way to think about that is to think about what kinds of businesses tend to be winner take all so places where you have some kind of network effect right you've got all the classic communications networks things like that you've got facebook all the phone companies like these are these are quintessential network effects businesses when there's a winner there's one winner and it's a big one right you can look at places where you have an information asymmetry companies like google they have a better product because they have way more data on what everyone is doing to refine their results. So they've consistently just stayed ahead of the curve of everyone else because they continue to have more and more data. So I think there are some general themes that you can take advantage of when you're just trying to think up what are the really, really big ideas that you can chase down. Uh, on the high level question, I'd go to lunch. Uh, and by that I mean I'd get the smartest people that I know, which are generally fortunately people that are on my team and I'd take them to sushi and this is what we generally do we I, we go to sushi we sit at a sushi restaurant in Boise and yes we have those uh, for a landlocked state and uh, we go to the same place and we sit at the same tables and we start brainstorming and we'll brainstorm for a few hours we'll identify some problems and then we'll start identifying plausible solutions and that'll usually carry over into our research lab where we sit in front of a whiteboard with uh, you pick your drink, uh, Dr. Pepper for one of them, uh, Red Bull for another, and uh, water for me, fortunately, because uh, I've got to have the, have the cooler head to prevail by the end of the discussion. And um, we usually start then refining the ideas of, okay, that's a fantastic solution, I'll though it's going to take us three years to develop. What's the good enough element of that solution that can get us into the game? And then once we come up with that solution, then we start evaluating, okay, is that scalable? And, is the, and then we start evaluating, all right, and are we going to make any money at it? And then we start asking people who are the potential customers. And there's no, no, there's no better way to ask them than just to sit them down and ask them, which is what we've done with ours. Is this a solution that you'd be interested in? What are the bells and whistles that you'd need to add? And then you keep going back to, and can we do that? Is it scalable? Can we do it with a relatively small number of people and, uh, and uh, make relatively large, num um, large dollars doing it? So. Um, when we want to find a solution, when we want to have our next idea, when we want to vet our next idea, we just go to lunch. Yep. In, in Boise. In Boise. That's a that's a that's a good restaurant. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Given raw, your business, I think you did a good yes, job at yes. the sushi place. Raw, raw restaurant in Boise, Idaho, is the birthplace of many many good ideas. So, so I'm kind of a fan of, of Bob's story about going up and talking to people at gas stations. So uh, for me, I find it hard to say I want to go out and come up with ideas. And it's more about making sure you're good at listening every day and in every interaction you have with other people because ideas get thrown by you every single day. You read about it, you hear about it, um, and it's just are you paying attention? And every once in a while something, you know, and this gets back to the passion comment, when you hear something that you're like, okay, that interests me, that intrigues me, that's probably going to catch some of your internal passion and you'll probably stick with it. So then go out and do some more research, talk to more people, read up on it, and see if you kind of get that validation as, as things support your hypothesis. And sometimes you're going to find that, no, nah, you're wrong. Okay, move on to something else. But a lot of it is, and a lot of the entrepreneurs I know, um, they've got a backlog of ideas. They've got 10, 15 things that they would love to work on right now, except they're working on something they think is their best idea. And if that stops, they'll move on to the next one. So, you know, a lot of folks, I've got a list, you know, on my laptop, actually up on the web on Backpack. Uh, of the things one day I want to get to, you know, after this company, what's the next thing I'm going to tackle? And it's always coming up. And so um, I think a lot of it is just 
being very aware and recognize the different data points as they come across your path to start drawing those connections that maybe other people don't see. And then you start investing the time to really go validate, is there a big market there? Can I reach these people? Uh, can I you know, derive most of the economic benefit from it? So, so I think this is a good transition point. Uh, because there's been, whether it be over sushi, whether it be walking down the street in every interaction, whether it be you know, talking to other folks around Stanford, going to the gas station, how do you guys feel about the, uh, the discussion of your ideas with other people? Do you feel like you have to hold it close to your vest? Or do you feel you can open it up? Or how do you think about that? I mean, you're probably not blogging about your best idea before you start it, but, you know, how would, how would you advise people in, in, in that spectrum of, I'm not talking to anybody because I don't want anybody to know what I'm doing because it's just such a great idea, it'll get copied too. You're posting a blog post saying, here's my idea, I think it's the greatest in the world, can you beat me to it? So what would you guys say? So I'll start. Um, I think one of the most common mistakes, and I've made it many times, is you think your idea is amazing and if anybody else hears it, they're going to rip it off. Uh, it's not true. Um, if it's a really great idea and it's really innovative, most people who hear it are going to tell you you're an idiot uh, because conventional wisdom, the, like, the really big opportunities tend to be when most people don't see it. So the really good ones are you're going to say it and a lot of people say that's just stupid. So for example, I don't know if it's going to be successful, but I find Blippi fascinating, right? Sharing your credit card spending. I cannot think of a startup in the last like five years where I've heard more people say that's the most idiotic thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and yet people are doing it, right? And why? And one of our investors was just at our board meeting the other day telling me about the benefits. He uses it and he, you know, he built this relationship with another entrepreneur and was like, oh, that's fascinating to me. So that's one of those things where I'm pretty sure they could have shown it to 10 people and they would have said, come on, don't do that, that's crazy. Um, plus the, the whole point about executing um, you can have a great idea, and everybody can have the same great idea, but it's the team that out-executes the others who really refines that idea, gets it in market, and proves it um, that's going to win. So, you know, yeah, you don't blog about it, but, you know, we had mock-ups of our original vision up on the web, you know, two years ago, two and a half years ago, showing exactly what we were going to build, and yet we have a lot of competitors that we've kind of blown by since then because they looked, you know, they could have seen it, they looked at it, and they didn't think we were right. Well, we kind of turned out to be right. So. That's great. I've got to build on Kevin's point, because I think if you talk, one, I think there's really no reason not to share with people. I mean, whether or not you put it out on the internet and, you know, S, you know, do a bunch of SEM, so that way lots of people find out about it is a different story. But functionally, talking to people in general gets you good feedback, and if it's a really great idea, you're going to get two responses. That's a terrible idea. Why the hell would I ever do that? Or, wow, that's the best idea I've ever heard. Can I join you? Right? People in general, the response is, wow, that's the greatest idea I've ever heard. Let me go try and do the exact same thing and build another team over here. Right? That, that's a very uncommon, uncommon response. So in general, it's, I think it's worth talking to people. The, you know, the, the, interesting, the interesting thing about sharing ideas is, one, it's a great way to recruit people. Right? Like you you want to be able to build the best team, and so you need to be able to tell a story that's compelling, that you can, that you can attract the best kinds of people. And so I think telling that story to other people will force you to build a concise, clear vision of what you're trying to do. And I think that's, that's a very important part of the process. And quite frankly, most people don't do anything. You could go, I mean, there are lots of great ideas, lots of very successful companies that in many respects were pretty obvious. And I'm not a big fan of intellectual property, but I mean, the issue with most of these companies isn't that they're that hard. They're not necessarily that difficult to do, but you could have told a million people and only seven of them would have even tried. So, I mean, functionally, it's that people don't take the first steps to go and build something, right? I, and there's a lot of perfectly reasonable excuses for not doing it, but in general, people just don't take the first step. And that's, and that's the big reason why lots of perfectly huge businesses get built and you wonder why there weren't 47 other people chasing them down. Uh, I agree with Justin and Kevin. We, we to some degree, uh, we have a very aggressive trade secret protection program in place, and that's because, particularly in the industry that counts in, well, that's actually ClickBank as well, we've been shamelessly plagiarized a lot of times. The differentiator is, is that we execute quickly. We have a, we're a scrum shop with, uh, with two-week two sprints, and um, we, we get things done, and we get them done quickly and efficiently. Um, 
but uh, people do shamelessly plagiarize good ideas. So we have a good trade secret protection program. We don't really let go of our secret sauce, but we do go out and talk to people about our ideas because that's a that's the best way to find out how good your idea is. You may think it's you, it may solve as someone else said earlier. It may solve a pain that you're currently suffering, but you don't know if you're you're just particularly bad at what you do. So your pain's far worse than anybody else's. So you might want to you might want to vet that a little bit. Um, so we we're kind of right in the middle. We protect our trade secrets, but then we come up with speaking points that we can talk to other people about, so they can't figure out exactly what we're going to do, but tells them enough so we can get good input. So when we go to market, we've optimized the likelihood of success. Right. Do you ask the people you talk to to sign an NDA? You know, uh, so I'm a former lawyer. I'm a recovering lawyer. Um, I know about those. Yeah, yeah. So uh, and and. Our team at Fenwick and West would probably kill me for saying this, but uh, you know it depends on the nature of the beast. But a lot of times you don't, and I don't know exactly how good those are anyway, because every PE you ever talk to signs an NDA, but then they go off uh, and somewhere along Sand Hill Road, every, everybody knows everything about everything, every other company because they go out and grab a cocktail together. So I don't know exactly how effective they are. Um, there are instances when we do, and there's a lot of instances when we don't. Uh, we're just very careful about what, what we disclose that nobody can invent our secret sauce. We're not posting source code. That want to have shared. Right. Okay. But a lot of what you're talking about is technical. I mean, you've, you've built technical barriers that are sort of not obvious to, to, you know, you go out and tell someone what your business is and the problems that you're solving and some right. high-level things. It's hard to reverse engineer that. But just buy a healthy patent portfolio and, yeah. and uh, all you're doing by shamelessly plagiarizing us is providing us with a revenue opportunity. So. <laughs> That's the form of lawyer talking. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I, I'm just going to book a table at the sushi restaurant next. Exactly. <laughs> raw. I think it's raw. 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 No, I've never protected an idea. I, I, I've found that the more I, I talk to people and the more responses I get, the more refined the idea becomes and the better I am at articulating it thereafter. And I think uh, over time we all develop a coterie of friends and sounding boards who, you know, maybe there's a half a dozen people wh whom you always go to and you talk to about ideas. And I, I know in Santa Barbara every Sunday morning, at least during the football season, a group of guys and I have breakfast and, you know, probably we bet football more than we discuss ideas. But it, it, you develop a group of people with whom you, you feel comfortable telling your ideas, and they give you honest, open feedback. And, and I think that uh, I've never tried to protect an idea because I've always thought if I want to do it, I'll try and do it with the best management team of anyone, and you know, maybe it's a confidence. But that's, that's where I stand. Great. <coughs> so how about uh, common mistakes in evaluating an idea? Where have you or your friends kind of ran into trouble. Bob, you were kind enough to share the story of Silicon Gaming. It's not like you kind of missed the behavioral aspects of that and the importance of location, but can you guys share some other examples where, uh, or that would kind of illustrate common mistakes that are made? I, you know, I, I've stayed with some ideas too long, um, uh, and uh, just because uh, you know, I, I, I was passionate about them, but not realistic. You know, we uh, we looked at the restaurant business 1992, I think it was, and I said, why is there not a casual Chinese like P.F. Chang's? And I did, you know, I did get with Philip Chang, and I did uh, do a couple of prototypes, and I kept saying, we just don't have it right. Well, you know, several million dollars later, we still didn't have it right. So it, it was it was a mistake. Just stay with it too long. And <laughs> how would you mitigate that risk in the future? Um, li you listen to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> no, truly. I mean, she said, you know, this food is terrible. I mean, she was very blunt about it, and I kept saying it. I, friend. <laughs> yeah, which is absolutely true. I mean, it, basically, um, it, you. I said, but it's authentic. It's authentic, and you know, I was, I was passionate about that part of the world, and I was, I was wrong. Um, the second mistakes that I've made are, with you know, sometimes I'm so anxious to proceed that I pick the management 
by background and not by how well will I get on with them. Uh, it's a hard thing to really figure out. You, 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 you pick someone because, God, what a great background. Uh, go back to this. This guy ran all of the restaurants for, you know, for Mary Corp and a big chain. <coughs> I'm just using one example, but the guy could, could not be an entrepreneur. I mean, he, you know, he had to have five people if he told a small story. And so I, I urge anyone who's going to be an entrepreneur and build a management team, spend a lot of time with the people you're going to hire. Um, get to know them better than the mistakes I've made in not doing that enough uh, in certain instances. And, 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 and you just get mesmerized by someone's background as opposed to do they, do they, do they fit with you. And so, can I go a little deeper on that? So, you're spending more time with them. What are you trying to get underneath in those discussions? Would I want to go to a, a, a ball game with this man or woman? Would I want to spend time with their family? I mean, it's it just, it, it takes time to get to know someone. And, and it's, it, it, there's go, in a startup, there's going to be the bad times. And do you want this person in the trenches with you? There's going to be the bad times. You're going to, you know, uh, I can remember certain times where I thought, you know, I'm not going to make payroll. And there's going to be bad times. And would this person really just say, forget about paying me or stuff like that? I, it's, uh, I've made mistakes. I mean, we all have, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I think people forget that the only reason companies go out of business is they run out of money. Like at the very fundamental level, the only reason you, you, you stop running your business is because you've run out of money. And in the world of startups, money equals time, right? The more money you have, the more cash you have in the bank, the more time you have to build your business. And that's just the fundamental nature of the game. So, you know, the question, I think the biggest mistakes that people tend to make is they somehow get the timing wrong. I mean, timing turns out to usually be one of the most important things with any business. And if you know, you're know you right, I mean, people have been saying mobile is the place to be in the 80s. Well, you know, if you started your mobile company in the 80s, probably not around today. If you started in the 90s, probably not around today. If you started in 2002, probably not around today, right? So functionally, it's a question of, you know, how much time do you have to build your business? And if you get it wrong, if, you, if it turns out that you thought it was a direct-to-consumer business, but you have to actually have to go and strike big distribution deals with, you know, major companies that take 24 months to do, you know, that's, that's money. And so people, you know, I think one of the biggest mistakes you can make is not understanding the amount of capital it takes to build the business into a sustainable point. Once you have a sustainable business, the world is very different. But a lot of startups, especially around this, this area, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not started in a sustainable way, right? It takes time to get there. And you have to make sure to have enough cushion that if you're wrong, you still have a chance to get there. Because if you're off by six months, it doesn't matter. Right. I agree with both Justin and Bob. I think, I guess the question was common mistakes. Um, mine would be probably letting uh, the fervor of creating an exciting, cool solution uh, uh, be the driver without properly sizing the market or proper, properly uh, evaluating your end consumer's needs. Uh, I see that a lot. Even in our shop, when our research team, when, we, when they start working on a project, we get real excited about something that's really cool. I mean, this is just a fantastic idea. And what we have to do with the model that we've created, we have to be really disciplined. We can take it a long way. We've developed products and been pretty close to being ready to go to market and had to say, okay, we've put a lot of time and energy into this thing. Is this the right move for us right now? And you have to be really willing to put your pride aside and say, you know what? We may not have we may not have evaluated that quite properly, so we're going to pull the pull the plug now because we want to be around tomorrow, and we don't want this to be a huge drain. And uh, you've just got to be really disciplined about that. And it takes a lot of pride to be able to say, yeah, we were wrong on this one. Next one, we're going to nail. So, did you ever have one where you felt in your gut that uh, it was wrong, but you went ahead and launched it, and then learned that your gut was right? Uh, fortuitously, no. Uh, we haven't we haven't done that yet. There's been ones where, um, in my gut, when we started the development process, uh, that I thought, "Wow, this is this is." I don't know. I don't see the full vision yet, but I but you know we're all we've all we all think it's got potential. And as we as as it evolved, as we got closer to launch, we decided, "Nah, this isn't the right move." And so we've 
been fortunate enough to pull the trigger um, and cut things off before we've gone to market. So can I ask a follow-up question to uh -huh. you specifically, Brad? Some people would argue that if you have a lot of very smart analytical people sitting around a table, which may be what your research lab is, maybe it's not, I don't know, mm -hmm. that contrarian ideas, you know, the ones that are the non-obvious ideas, will never make it through the table because there's too many people who can shoot down any contrarian idea. So how, because you do have contrarian ideas. Oh, yeah. You've done things that other people probably didn't see as obvious. Right. So how do you manage that so that the, the analysts don't crush it? Well, and, and I'm, I want to extend it more broadly. It's like your friends who are analysts, your friends who are good consultants and bankers and all that, that you're, you might be bouncing your ideas <laughs> off that uh, just can't see why you want to go after that stupid idea. Well, there's a lot of things. First of all, uh, we, we all recognize that whenever we start these discussions, we have to be open, honest, and fearless. I want people to come up with contrarian ideas because to the degree they're not coming, throwing those out on the table, we're going we're gonna to make mistakes that we didn't have to make, and we're going to spend money that we didn't have to spend in order to figure out that we made those mistakes. So uh, I think we've worked together enough that we understand what each other's strengths and weaknesses are, and we're able to, to factor that in at this point. It, we've, been, we've been successful at what we've, what we've done because sometimes we recognize, yeah, He's got a good point there, but there's also this proclivity that he has to, you know, not necessarily like this sort of idea. And we're able to call each other out on those things. And so somehow we make it work just by being very, very open, very honest, and communicating. We're probably, if you ask one of my COOs, uh, we communicate too much. He's, he hears the side of not talking so much, but I'm, I'm the Dr. Phil of the business world, I guess. So uh, we... Uh, we just know each other. We work through them, and we and we and if people have legitimate concerns, we 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 drive we drill down on them. So have, have you ever pushed against the entire team, or had a subset of the team push against the entire team to move an idea forward? Oh yeah, I mean, of course. So you carry the big baseball bat. <laughs> uh, there's a few big baseball bats. Okay. So there's there's more than one. But because um, one yeah. of the dynamics I saw, just to share context, at some of the firms I worked at, there'd often be a partner who said, I really believe in this idea. It may be the sixth search engine in the world. It may be two guys that are very young that don't seem to have complete perspective on what it takes to build a business. But with, this is going to be huge. And the other partner said, no, we don't want to be in the sixth search engine. It's the technology is not that differentiated. The core technology is very similar to the technology in the existing search engines. What do we really have here? And then one person sometimes just puts it down. They just say, We're, I, I just have to do this. Uh, so that was what I was trying to bring yeah, out. With we've that. had those situations. Okay. So at the end of the day, the buck stops here. Um, so sometimes I got to make the call. Yeah, sometimes I got to make the call. So, um, Good. but it's, uh, we, we've got a healthy, we get into some healthy debates, which is actually a lot of fun. Any other common mistakes? So I would say, you know, two most common mistakes I see. One is what everybody's talked about, uh, which is you tend to get locked in a solution. You know, you don't, you don't believe the data that comes back that says this idea that you think is awesome isn't so awesome. Um, that's really easy to do. We all get attached to things we love. Um, so doing that. The other one I want to talk about is uh, one of the things really hard at the early stage is just maintaining focus because you're going to have so much data going on. You're, you, you, know, can, you can only do so many things. Getting distracted is very easy to do. Chasing shiny objects and new opportunities, very because you know, when you start, it's pretty rare that you know the ultimate answer when you start. You're going to get there. It's going to be a journey, but it's very easy to get too far off course. <laughs> And especially if you're, you know, if you're chasing money, if you're chasing a big deal, do things like that. It's very easy to do. Um, and so, you know, time and resources are precious and limited. So kind of focus and ruthless prioritization are pretty important. It's very easy to get distracted. So how do you balance that? Because I like to think of that early formation stage as almost being this drunkard's walk. You're in this process of discovery. You talk to one guy at the gas station, he says one thing, and you're like, ah, oh, that's discouraging. You talk to another guy at the gas station, tells you something different. And then you talk to your buddy and says, oh, I have this friend that knows how to do these exchanges. And you start building the idea. How do you know how much, because you, you kind of need to weave a little bit, right? Back and forth as you have discussion. So are you talking about post that phase? You've decided it and you're going to go. I think it's is all that, through. So, um, so there are certain things where you know, if you're getting conflicting data, you just need to invest more time to go, you know, find, and are you looking at the data the proper way, right? Are you not, are you missing something? 
you know, you're, you think you're on kind of the root cause, but you're really looking at a symptom, and you just need to dig and maybe get some more data points. But I think the bigger risk is actually once you get beyond that, you start, there are some short-term pressures around timing and maybe milestones that you need to hit that some opportunities may present themselves that say, you know what, I can, I can demonstrate more progress in the short term, but that might take me off course a little bit. And it's a constant trade-off of where am I trying to get to versus what can I do today, tomorrow, you know, what can give me a little bit of money or a little bit of runway, but it's not quite core to what we're trying to do. Um, don't know that there's an easy answer on how to do that, but I think it's one of the biggest risks uh, in terms of things to watch out for. Talk a little bit about the risk of um, you've got a contrarian idea, and now could you hit it on this, Kevin, and you're walking up and down Sand Hill Road, and they, they don't see it. So can you just put a little color on how you feel about that? Would you literally walk away from money completely, bootstrap at $20,000 a year salary? Would you give up at that point? How would you respond to that? Uh, well, given that I thought about giving up maybe five, six times before we actually got our money the first time, um, that's a challenge. I mean, it's tough. Um, we did bootstrap it, but everybody has a different risk profile, right? You may not have twenty thousand dollars that you can afford. You know, I've been working in the valley and been well compensated. I could afford to do it for a little while, but if you're not in that situation, everybody's got to make a personal choice of, you know, for your situation. You know, how passionate are you? Do you believe this? And a lot of times, you know, we had a lot of people pass on us the first time, and then we had a lot of term sheets on our second time. So um, we were able to prove some people wrong, but you're going to find that a lot of people are not going to believe in your idea. That's why my favorite quote is, it's about perseverance. It's about, are you willing to stick with it? You are going to screw up a lot of stuff. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. But if you view those as the best opportunities to learn and get better so that, you know, eventually you'll figure it out and you'll show the traction and the money will come find you. Um, if, I guess my advice would be if you can't get <coughs> the money early on or you can't convince folks, go prove it in market. Because if your idea is legit, you'll be able to prove it in market. Um, and once you do that, you'll get a lot of believers. So I want to ask one other question, which kind of struck me as we were talking, because you guys keep talking about the importance of the team. When you're at the early phases of idea generation and idea evaluation, do you want to have a co-founder with you doing that, or a couple of co-founders? And if you do, what kind of people would you recommend be there at that time? Because you don't know exactly where it's going to all go, do you? Any comments on that? standpoint um, you you want someone who understands the business that you're going into pretty well you want someone who's compatible and you want someone who is cut of the cloth of the entrepreneur who can take adversity well to your point about perseverance um, sometimes you make mistakes in the beginning and you recast uh, but um, I, I think you, it's, from my standpoint, my standpoint only, it's easier to have a partner. So you'd rather not be a lone eagle, figure it all out yourself, and then find the right partner for that particular the, business? The first deal I ever did, um, I was 5% and someone else was 95%. And he called me partner, and I learned something from that because it, it gave me the feeling that I was really with him, and, I, I, and it taught me the value of treating people with respect and as if they were partners, even though it was 95-5. Okay. Anybody else want to touch up? So for me, it came down to, you know, I couldn't write code well enough uh, to start a software company, so I definitely needed some, someone to partner with. Um, so there was a necessity there. Um, but what I've learned over time, so my co-founder and I uh, get along very well not because we have the same mindset, but because we have very complementary mindsets. Um, he's a very even-keeled person, and I'm like this. I'm like Steve Ballmer. Um, I get really frustrated, and then I get really excitable. Uh, and he's there to balance me, and he's got a great technical mind and good product sensibility. So um, if you are going to get a partner, it is, agree with Bob, uh, you want to know that person really well because there, a lot of stuff will go wrong, and it's, you know, the classic lines about you find out what people are really like when stuff goes wrong. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure you are in the trenches with somebody who believes in the vision, is committed, um, and can react well to adversity and move and be creative. And Did you deeply reference check your co-founder? I got to work with him. Oh, okay. 
So we both came out of the same company. So that was your deep yes. reference checking was your personal yeah, we, experience. We both found that neither one of us uh, could get along with large company life anymore. So we had the same passion for going and creating stuff. So. Anything else? I mean, it's basically like getting married to people, right? If you're if you're going to have a partner, it's it's not a it's not you know, it's not a fling, right? This is something that's going to you're going to be in for a long time and to the point of you want to know that the person you're getting involved with is someone that you want to be involved with for a long period of time. I think the you know the issue is with one person, it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to have a conversation, mm -hmm. and you know having having another person, you can, you can have a constructive conversation and you can get to a better outcome. Now this, there's, a, there's a breaking point to this. Three people, okay, you know, four people, five people, six people. I mean, it starts to get to the point where it's unmanageable. So you know, there's probably like a cutoff around three. You know, two is probably better than one, but you know, one is definitely better than four. So you know, it's, it's good to be able to have a conversation. I think that's important when you're starting something. Super. Yeah, I agree. It's hard to have an idea-rich environment if it's you. Um, so, uh, even if you have the big stick. And yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter <laughs> how big your stick there. is or how great your ideas are. But, uh, but I agree. the The key with um, with what Bob and Kevin have both said, which is the key, is make sure you've got somebody that, as Bob said earlier, you're going to want to be able to go to a baseball game with. You don't have to agree all the time. In fact, you probably don't want the person you're always going to agree with as your partner. But you better make sure you can. You can handle having sushi with them regularly. So. <laughs> that's great. Okay. So, so if I can add one other note on that. Uh, another thing that I think is important because we talk about kind of the, the team, um, your network outside, personal life, just having other people who are supportive is going to be pretty important too, uh, especially when stuff goes wrong. So, you know, having a wife that will tell you that you're nuts or having friends that will tell you to keep believing that, you know, don't give up. Um, this is, I mean, this is just true in business in general. Having other people to believe you and support you um, is more important down the road than it probably appears when you start. So, thank you. So I'm going to open up to questions in just a couple of minutes. But I want to do any of you guys just have a burning thing you want to say, given that we've had this discussion. We're like, gosh, I, I wish David had asked that question, or I need to get this out. Anything you want to say before we move to questions? Because I want to give people a chance to think about questions they'd like to ask. To be an entrepreneur requires you to be irrational to a certain extent because it is marginally insane. To be irrational? Irrational. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's marginally insane to go out and try and start a company with nothing, right? I mean, this is, this is a difficult process. Lots of things will go wrong. Everyone will tell you that there's a high likelihood of failure. The statistics bear that out. So you have to be marginally insane to do that. And the, the people that are the best at it are the ones that can somehow balance the fact that, you know, they'll take all the data that says this is a terrible, terrible idea and throw it out and say, no, it doesn't matter, it actually is a great idea, and they'll be right some of the time. And you know, also have the flexibility to get it back and know that it, you know, it, I need to stop this, I need to go do something else. And that's an impossible thing from anyone sitting on a panel to figure out you know, which, way, which, which time is the right time to pick that path. But that's, I mean, that's really what it, it th those are the ultimately successful entrepreneurs, and it's a really hard thing to do. Yeah, it does get back to that passion thing. You, know, you have to have the fire inside to deal with all the stuff that's gonna happen. Because if it's just an academic exercise, if it's just, you know, I, I want this great business, when things get hard, you need something else to hold on to. You need to really, really want it, believe in it, whether it's anger that's driving you or just frustration, what, whatever it takes to motivate you to really want to make this happen. Um, that's probably the number one thing I've heard from every investor when they evaluate. When you talk about passion, it's, you know, they want to see that. They want to see that fire that, will just will you know will it to success because it's a lot of work i mean it's a lot of work <laughs> you know you're 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 you no know, we have great resources backing our startups but it's still a lot of work you're still going to your first customer and they're like all right where are your references well you can call my mom she thinks i'm great uh <laughs> also there's a couple other guys that i hang out with regularly but uh you know it's it's a lot of work to to break through uh with a with a startup well, I, you know, I, I said this to my oldest son uh, a few weeks ago. If you find something for which you really have a passion, you'll never work a day in your life. And it's really true. If you really have the passion, I mean, um, my best definition of an entrepreneur is someone who has no other choice. You know, it's just what you want to do. That's great. So, show of hands, how many questions out there? One, two, three, four, five, about nine. And we've got... 
15 minutes. So if we're going to get through all of these, we need to do this in about a minute and a half. So why don't we do this? Ask your question, and if I could ask the panelists, whoever <coughs> kind of look at each other, and if somebody thinks it's theirs, grab it. <laughs> and then if you have one add-on comment, but let's not go through all four people. Is that okay? Great. This is for Justin, I think. That's good. Um, that I makes it easy for us. <laughs> No, it's good. Thank you. I, I mean, so functionally, I, I agree with you. I think that's why venture capital exists, right? I mean, if there if there wasn't someone to give you money to run a business and give all your product away for free, you know, it, like that's that's what makes the valley run. That's that's what's made it run for for years. I think Kevin's point of his experiences are very true, though. You can go out there, you can have an idea. People, you know, people don't buy into it until you get market traction, right? And then and then you know, it's a completely different investment. And so, from an investment standpoint, you know, if you're if you're talking about making really early stage investments. I say I don't. I wouldn't care. I don't care about the idea that much. I care about the people. I want to see two or three people who are incredibly passionate about something, who work well together, and are going to go figure it out. And like I said, I've invested in many of those teams, and they've come up and done completely different things six months later. And that's great. That's actually, in some sense, what you want to have happen. But if you're going through, you know, if you're if you're going through and trying to solve that distribution problem, yeah, I mean, it, once you get market traction, there has to be a business. It has to, it has to work, right? There has to be a model that makes sense. And I think that just kind of depends on where you are on the, on the timeline of going through that, you know, building that company. Anybody else want to talk about business model? Business model is not an issue. I think if you're talking about really early stage investing where you're writing a, you I'm know. I'm talking about idea, but evaluation. I'm not, I'm not. I, I, mean, I think it, it, it completely depends. It, it may not matter at all, right? I mean, you could have looked at, I mean, if you looked at Google back, you know, when they were out doing, you know, shopping their deal, it wouldn't have mattered. Like Facebook, it wouldn't have mattered. All of the big successes were for free. But there was still a long-term concept of, you know, where you, where you thought you, you could probably get money, but it wasn't, you could still build very valuable businesses without, without that. I mean, YouTube was a very valuable business, and, you know, today it's, it's a very successful division of Google, but... They didn't make money functionally for years. I'll, I'll tell you this. I think different venture capitalists have very different opinions about this. And if you are a, a, a consumer internet investor, venture capitalist, and you understand media business models, you may be much more comfortable saying, I don't care about revenues because you can get to hundreds of millions of eyeballs. We know how to monetize those somehow. Versus on the enterprise side, you're not going to get that at all. If you go to somebody at venture capital and say, look, we're going to actually give hardware and software to enterprises for free. and We'll figure it out later. They're going to say you're crazy. You know, you have to have a business model. You're selling to enterprises because if you sell something, give something to free to the enterprise, often they put no value on it and you have no commitment from the enterprise itself because the cost of that is much more than just the cost of the software. I'll, so, I'll give you a full set argument with that. I mean, I think there's a real innovation in, in how enterprise software is being done today because people are taking the channels that have worked on the consumer internet and a lot of the viral channels, spreading it through the enterprise and then going back to the enterprise and asking them for money later, That's right? So, I, I mean, I think they're... Well, Palm Computing, RIM, others did the exact same thing. They've got, there's consumer yeah. entry points, but to keep moving on, I think you're going to have to be very careful about who you talk to and understand the bias of those venture capital firms because people have different tolerances for that. So, okay. Kevin, you mentioned the importance of user feedback early in validating an idea. Do you have any advice for the best way to do that and get users in front of it? Is it mock websites? Is it? Yeah, the cheapest, fastest way you can do it. Um, so, uh, is it? I'm trying to think. Is it? I can't remember the name of the author. Um, wrote a book called "Don't Make Me Think," uh, who talks about our tendency to want to overthink kind of 
especially with, from an academic mindset, uh, how we do research. <laughs> the most important thing about research is do it quickly, show it to somebody who's even a reasonable proxy for your target customer, and do it with paper, <coughs> on the web, you know, HTML mockups, um, even if it's conversations, napkins, you know, gas stations, throw ideas out there. The most important thing is just get some early feedback from some potentially prospective customers um, because you'll, you'll get more feedback in the first iteration from three to five people to then go modify the idea. So it's more important to kind of iterate quickly than it is to put together like the perfect research project or get the right prototype and you know, the, it's just early data is better than like the perfect data later after the investment. Thank you. So I have this question about uh, trust and smart follow-up. So I have an idea, and I'm going to be a passionate for it, but I think like, there are a lot of challenges that are in the in sector in India, rural sector in India. So I want to know what are your thoughts about letting anyone else follow it when they get up first to the market and learning from the mistakes. Yeah, I think it, it's going to depend on the idea. Uh, so there are definitely places where we have first mover advantage, um, but there are, a, I think a lot of ideas out there tend to be an iteration on somebody else has already tried it. And to, I think, most of the points people have made, it's not necessarily the idea. It is about the execution. So Fast Follower works really well if you see somebody do it and they're just not doing it quite right. We're actually following, there was a company who tried to do exactly what we were doing, built too complex a product, approached the market uh, in the wrong way. They got into a switching game. And we looked at it and we said, that's you know very similar vision for what we wanted to do. <coughs> Well, we disagreed with their tactics and we came in, so we were not the first ones with this idea. Great. So, entrepreneurship is all about taking big risks. How do you are here is take those that do the idea and uh, take big risks as possible? But how crazy is crazy? Like, <laughs> finding Google or reading Apple be a viable idea? <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't think that, I mean, creating any business is hard. And so in some sense, you know, building the biggest business possible isn't significantly more risky than building a smaller business. I mean, they're, 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 you know, there's some nuance there, but the difference between running a, you know, a company that's 500 million, you know, valued at $500 million and a billion dollars is not substantially different, right? I mean, there, there, are, there are a lot of, you know, there are differences, but in some sense, you wanna, you wanna go after the biggest possible idea because a lot of the challenge that you're gonna see in terms of building the team and distribution, things like that, they're sort of constants, right? And they only they, they scale literally, whereas other things don't scale literally. They're exponential, so. In line with your question, uh, the <laughs> best thing you can do as an entrepreneur is really know yourself. Really, don't, don't, don't BS yourself. Know yourself. Know your real capabilities. That's the hardest thing. Yes, have a grand vision, but know who and what you can do. And uh, that takes a while, but it, it, it's a very important factor in success. I'll add one bit to that. If you're going to take a bold strategy like that, you better have an angle. You better understand something nobody else understands and go after it. Because we'll use Google as an example. When they were getting started, they knew Yahoo, they knew Inktomi, they knew AltaVista, and they knew the limits of those businesses. And they were absolutely convinced that they were not committed to innovating in search. And other people on the server said, wait, you know, Excite's worth $7 billion, At Home's worth $15 billion, Inktomi's worth $12 billion. They're going to keep innovating forever. You'll never catch them. It's like, that isn't what was happening inside those companies. They had stopped. So, who else? <laughs> Cash flow. Credit cards. Work. Be willing to work insane hours and surround yourself with other people who are as well. Great. All four hit that one. Let's keep going. If you're on your own right now, this is a bit more of a question. How do you even begin to think about distributing equity if you're going to find a market for benchmarks or anything like that? Talk to a lot of people. People are always willing to, that's a topic that people will talk ad nauseum about um, and get a lot of input. There's, there's all kinds of benchmarks depending on the industry, but uh, the, there's no subs substitute for bending a lot of people's ear and saying, how'd you do it? What are you doing? What are you taking? And uh, I, I, I tell people all the time, I'd rather own 5% of a $100 million pie than 100% of a $1 million pie. So uh, a lot of people don't, don't ever figure that out. Yeah, I think that's actually the biggest risk, and we hear that a lot with folks worrying so much early on about equity stakes and sharing. 
uh, the answer is it is much more important to have a reasonable share of a success that, you know, splitting up a tiny pie doesn't matter as much as making sure it's a huge pie. Be generous. <coughs> okay, yes. Brad, you talk about sort of the inside of your business and how you vet your own ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, without giving away your sort of secret sauce, you talk about, is there, a, again, more in this theme about really vetting those uh, you know, crazy ones and, and something that is relatively uh, viable? It, and the question is? So, so is, is there a, uh, maybe a process or maybe the three top things you look at? Yeah, we have, a very, we have a very formalized process now. It used to be, it used to be you know, done with a lot of emails and whiteboards, but now we have a we have a, a vetting process that we go through. It's becoming more and more formal. Even the even the transition from the research team to the development team and the spec and the whole transfer processes are all pretty formalized right now. With an eye to getting buy-in early, getting we've 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 structured it pretty well, and we even have a nice little picture about it uh, how it all works out. That I noticed that a lot okay, of folks have. Can we scan that and give it everybody? Yeah, <laughs> not so much. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, if you're really nice, will you show it to somebody at coffee? After yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to. <laughs> no, but we we have a formal process that we go through, and we have boxes that we check, and uh, we keep. That's where we're diligent. We keep checking those boxes and going back. And each board meeting, they go back. Is this still, is this still the direction we want to head? Are we still? Is, there, is this still economically viable? Can we get this to market? Can we? Can we do what we need to do? Is, it, is there any like, uh, you know, I don't want to ask you for the slide, but yeah, any sort of theme. Uh, that maybe t the top three check boxes that you say or gates that, that you uh, have to get that idea through? Yeah, those probably differ from entity to entity, but ours are really, are we going to have to hire a bunch of people? Because we like keeping it lean and mean. I like having an organization of 100 people between, that's all subsidiaries. Um, we, we know each other, we know each other's families, we know each other well, and we, we, uh, we, we we're very agile as a result of that. Um, and can we do it highly profitably? Uh, we don't like to go into endeavors that we're going to take four, four, five, six years to in order to hit profitability. Um, we like to do it early, and we really most of our businesses surround uh, financial models that are <coughs> transaction-based. Okay. You had a question? Um, a lot of us in the room are fairly young entrepreneurs, and I was wondering if you have any suggestions, particularly when it comes to evaluating are there particular industries or ideas that are too big or too difficult to crack for a young entrepreneur? Or do you see or do you have any advice um, about that? I think great idea is a great idea, whether it comes from a seven-year-old or a 20-year-old or a 40-year-old or older. I mean, it's a, if it's a great idea and you can you can articulate it and validate it and build the management team for it, go for it. Take your dreams and go for it. Build the team. If there's some reason why you need relationships or something, go find that person and make them part of the team. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I'm, sorry. I'm trying to remember who's had their hands up for a while. Who's had their hand up for a while? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, that, that's that's a tough question to to answer without kind of specific details. But I think the fact is, I mean, the Google example that that Dave gave is is perfectly accurate, right? I mean, all these big companies were perceived to be doing a lot of a lot of innovation. You know, Google came along, and realized those companies were completely dead on the inside from a technical standpoint, and then over time, you know, they built a better product and they just launched it. And from a consumer perspective, they gave you a better answer, so people switched, right? It's you know, it, it takes time to change things, but you know, they they. They didn't, they didn't get caught up in the perception that everyone else did, that all these other companies would continue to innovate indefinitely. And switching costs were low, switching which is... Switching costs were low in that example. Yeah, it's one click away. Mm -hmm. What? Switch back, it's equal. Yeah. I feel like you guys addressed the service aspect. Like, you know, anyone can take a nice This guy has a clarification. So you said a service business the, that requires a lot of money? Well, no. Anyone can start writing a program. They can right. sit down, read a book, and write a program. Yeah. 
But what about if your idea is going to take a lot of money and it, you know, it needs investors and you don't have that? You know, where do you have so you need money up front before you can even get going kind of thing? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. I, I can't really speak to it because one of the reasons I'm a fan of software is because it's so cheap to get started. Um, you know, we could bootstrap it. So, the more capital you need, the more risk it is. Different kinds of investors are going to invest in that kind of business. I mean, green tech in general is a heavily capital intensive business. A lot of those things came out of labs at universities. So, I mean, to a certain extent, those are projects that people have been working on. There was some scientific advance that they thought they could commercialize. So, there's, there's, I mean, usually there's a substantial amount of work that happens before people are willing to pony up a lot of money, no matter what it is. <coughs> So I'd say you better have a tremendous advantage over the current players, a 20 to 1, a 10 to 1 advantage. If you're going to try to convince somebody to give you a lot of money up front on a concept, that, so they, they're going to have to see that there's a big prize uh, for winning. I'm sorry, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, so I want to get back to the co-founder thing, so that's a lot of, uh, you know, it's a challenge when you're not Are there any trade-offs that you see making in a co-founder that are just So mistakes in picking co-founders, something like that. Things to watch out for. I would say the two most important things we talked a little bit about. You got to have kind of shared mindset, like you're trying to do the same thing. Then you need comparable levels of commitment, um, and it's you really got to know what's. You, you both have to be solving for the same thing because if you're solving for different things, forget it. It's, it's going to go poorly. You, you, you virtually, when you have a co-founder and a new idea, you're talking 24-7. I mean, you, you, you could be talking at 6 in the morning and 10 at night. You better, you better have someone who has the same mindset and passion you do. Okay. Justin's right when he calls it a marriage. It's absolutely a marriage. It's the exact same thing. Like, the same stuff that will go wrong in a relationship, it's, yeah. Great. Maybe not all the same things. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay, guys. Back, back row. We got. This is the last one. Sorry. Go. Ahead. Kevin, you sort of touched upon this, but for the rest of you, if you had to start new ventures tomorrow, what would those be, and what markets would you go after? I'd tell you, but I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> but ideas are easy. Just lay them yeah. out there. Come on. No, we stick to our core space, which is you know. If you look at any of the businesses we've worked in, they're in the e-commerce space and mostly transaction-based, and we understand the risks associated with doing business online and uh, with participating in the online community and be something in that space mitigating that risk. Anybody else want to hit that one? All four of you guys can take that one if you like. I'd love to see somebody go after title insurance and reinvent the uh, <laughs> refinance and real estate space. Title insurance, okay. You have to sell houses to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just even in refinances, the fact that you have to get a, the exact same policy over and over again, yeah. that is market inefficiency right there. Justin Bob, want to throw one out? Well, I, you know, I, I, I think you look at the world and you say there are so many opportunities. I, I, you know, I have a, an increasing passion for education. I suspect the next thing I do will be in education. But there are so many things, but you have to be passionate about it. You have, and, and have fun. It has to be something you really want to do. And, and not just because it can make money and be a big business, because you really enjoy it. And, and don't, uh, entrepreneur is the most enjoyable thing in the world if, if, if you have a real passion. I think there are a lot of things that have been, a lot of tools that have been built on the consumer internet to, for lack of a better word, manipulate people into doing what you want them to do. I think you could probably take a lot of those tools and help people make the decisions that they find difficult to make, make their lives better. So I'll give you one last idea. Make a list of 10 things and make, start with silly ideas and then drop them off the bottom and keep adding. Your list will get better and better. Attack the top three things on the list and see if there's anything fundamentally wrong with those ideas. And so it's kind of a hypothesis driven approach and you'll start getting better and better at this. But you gotta force yourself with discipline around kind of walking out in the world and looking for things every single day that could be problems and put them on that list and force rank them every day. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Can you please give the panel a big...